My guest today joins me via audio only. It's a first that I haven't been able to sit down with the guest face to face. The reason being is that he's located all the way over in the UK. His name is Rick Veronisi, and I reached out to him after reading an article that he had published on Medium that really just hit me hard. I'm not going to spoil the fun as he and I are going to cover all those topics of the article, but when you're through, you should definitely go back and give it a read. Now, before we get started, I felt like it was worth noting how cool of an industry it is that we work in. I was blown away by Rick's willingness to help the audience of this show, although never even meeting them. He's a fellow UX designer across the pond, experiencing the same things we experience over here. I'm definitely stoked to be connected to someone of this caliber, so thank you very much, Rick. Without further ado, let's get this show going. Thank you for joining me on Design Today. I appreciate your time, man. Of course, man. Thanks for having me on. This is a, a cool opportunity to be able to speak to somebody who's over on the other side of the world, yet we share the same passion. We're going through similar experiences. Uh, it, it's a cool experience for me. I hope it's the same for you. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, I wanted to, before we jump into the topic and get into everything today, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself, but I first want to kind of tell the story of how this whole thing came to be. Uh, for most of the people who listen to the podcast, they know that all my recordings happen uh, in my home. You know, I do these things face to face and I don't do them with people, you know, outside of the area. Um, but it was a couple of weeks ago, I was, you know, just perusing one of my favorite websites uh, for design news and they linked to an article that you had written. Um, the six rules to own design It was an article that you had published on medium, uh, what back in November, November. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. How time flies. Um, and as I read through that article, I was just kind of floored by the insight that was shared and then how much I related to the insight. I mean, I kind of laughed with somebody else that I work with going like, if I didn't know any better, I wrote this article. Uh, just because you represented so many things that I could relate to. And it just felt so passionate. It felt so honest, so genuine that uh, it's, you know, it was a great article. And I'm going to leave that link to the article in the description or in the meta of this podcast. Uh, for those who want to check it out and give it a read, I suggest that they do it because there's just gems that we won't be able to cover in everything today. Thank you. Um, before we get into it, though, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you're at, uh, your career, uh, maybe something cool about uh, being in the UK. I don't know. Uh, give us a little bit of insight into Rick. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, I'm Rick. Um, I'm a UX designer. Uh, I'm Italian. I, I've been living in the UK for about five years now. I don't really have a specific background, uh, so there's no big story about I was passionate about design since I was a kid or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, I actually stumbled upon design uh, about six years ago and uh, have been doing it ever since. Uh, first as a freelancer and then I go into my first full-time UX gig about two years ago. Uh -huh. I work for a company here in the UK that operates in uh, financial services. Uh, specifically in comparison of credit cards, loans, mortgages, and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, this is me in a nutshell. Uh, really, about living in the UK, um, a apart from having four seasons in a day, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here in Bristol. It's a, it's a really creative city. Uh, and I, I've enjoyed it so far, and you know, I recommend everyone visiting it. You know, I've never been over to the UK. I've never been over. I mean, I, I, the only time I really traveled was to, uh, I went to Germany for a quick pit stop and on my way to India. Uh, but I'd love to get out there to the UK and, and visit around there. So much history. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, and how long have you been in the UK? Uh, about five years now. Five years. And is that yeah. when you started with this company that you're currently with? Uh, no, actually, I started, but I started freelancing. Uh, well, I, I was doing that back home as well, but I, yep. it, it, that's when I actually kickstarted my career, when I moved there and, you know, started reaching out to people and, you know, offering my services. And, um, and then I realized, well, maybe I, I do need to work in a team. I do need to, you know, feel that uh, full-time uh, experience. So I started applying for jobs and... Uh, yeah. The rest of the history. That's cool. 
and your company that you work for recently got acquired. Is that right? How long ago was that? That's correct. Uh, well, we've been acquired twice in the span of uh, two years. So, oh, wow. yeah, uh, you know, it was a pretty small company uh, to start with. And then we got acquired from uh, another bigger company that operates in pretty much the same uh, space. And recently we got acquired by, um, by do you know, Red Ventures? There's a, there's a big company there in the U.S. that uh, basically um, operates in that same, very much same space. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So it's been quite, quite right. Cool. Um, I, let's uh, go ahead and jump into this uh, article that you had written. Tell me a little bit about where this article came from. Like, what was the background that uh, spurred you to write this? Uh, I would say it was a chain of events, to be honest. Uh, in, in the months prior to, to writing the article, I was going through a period where I got a little complacent uh, with work, with my relationship, you know, with life in general. And I initially thought it was because I was losing passion about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I thought, you know, I'm approaching 30 and I was thinking, this is it. Uh, I'm going to turn 30. Uh, you know, I have a nine to five job now. So this is the boring routine everyone talks about. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't the case, obviously. So I got into a bit of a self-help spiral uh, and it led me to pick up this book, The 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Yeah. And uh, as I was reading the book, I realized about these rules were nothing more than common sense for me. Uh, and I thought, well, I want other people to know about this. And since I always wanted to practice my right thing, I thought, let's write about it. Condense these 12 rules into uh, six and you know, make it a little bit shorter and make an actionable mini guide to being a better designer, which yeah. by the way, will serve me as a reference when I go back to the article because I'm, I'm far from perfect and I don't do all these things that I talk about so perfectly, but it's useful to have, you know. For someone who, you know, was just wanting to get more into writing or wanted to get uh, practice writing again, you really knocked it out of the park with this first article. Thank you, thank you very much. No, it was uh, definitely worth a read. And one of the things that you did in the read uh, that, again, I'm going to hope that we can address as we go through it. But uh, for those who go back and read for themselves, uh, you've got specific action items and takeaways and uh, action points. Uh, is that what you call them? Actionable insights? Actionable insight, yeah. And I think that's really what helps drive home this reading from just another article that you read while you're sitting at your desk to... Here's what I can actually do. And I want to make sure that we cover those as we go through it. But let me uh, jump right into this first point that, uh, that you have. And this is probably the point that caught my attention as we were reading. Uh, but you said, uh, you're a badass. Portray an image of competence. Uh, speak to me a little bit about that, why that was important to you as you were reading. Yeah, sure. Uh, this one is originally uh, stand up straight with your shoulders back in the book. and uh, Peters's approach to this rule is much from a evolutionary biological point of view. For me, it's about how we carry ourselves in uh, our everyday life, in our day-to-day -day interactions, how we speak to others, uh, the message we're trying to get to them, and how we feel about it too. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, that, that's the main takeaway from it is, is you know, to stand up straight with your shoulders back is about how you, you portray yourself. So be, be confident, you know? Now, would somebody say this is like the fake it till you make it thing? No, I wouldn't say so. No, it's, it's definitely more, it's a, it's a manifesto to express your ideas. It's, it's, not, it's not really, you know, fake it till you make it. That, that leads to delusion eventually. Because if you don't feel like you're, you're making it and you just think about it, well, that doesn't take you anywhere. Sure. You know, the idea of like standing up straight, uh, shoulders back, that kind of thing. I also think it carries a little bit into, you know, the work environment, how you portray yourself, whether it be at like a stand up meeting uh, or any meeting in general. One of the ugly habits that I have just because I can get so lax at work is I can't, this is gonna be funny because as soon as I say it, everyone's gonna be like, you do what? I always put my feet up on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> like a boss. <laughs> yeah. And not even like that. I just, I sit back uh, and I just, relaxed. you know, I'm just relaxed. And then I go like, holy smokes, 
like there in some cultures that's very disrespectful but mm -hmm. even in a pretty disrespectful culture like our own um even that i think takes it to another step uh mm -hmm. and so that's something that i'm always mindful of is like yes dylan you're comfortable but get your feet off the desk you know <laughs> and you know i did it myself a few times and uh, uh as long as people call you out on it that's fine because you know they tell you this is a stand-up so you shouldn't yep. be anywhere but standing up so <laughs> yeah uh but then even into the other meetings that take place throughout the day it was just you know you get into those meetings portray this image of competence you know portray that you're an expert uh and i like how you said this is kind of more of a manifesto as opposed to the fake it till you make it um yeah these ask yourself uh, questions that you included in the article how did you come up with those is this something that you were asking yourself or what yeah so i do uh i do a lot of uh tracking of you know my I, uh, my interactions i wouldn't say i'm no i'm i'm there every second with my diary or whatever you want to call it but uh i try to to notice people's reactions to what i say and uh and, and i tend to write it down so so most times when i go to journal uh, you know uh, write about my day or, or something like that i uh i ask myself some questions how did it go what could you improve and um i think you know those those questions come up as you uh, the more introspective you get the more questions you ask yourself you know so i just wanted to share what i ask myself with others and hopefully you know it helps other people too yeah so if you're listening, the, the actual insight or the question that you could ask yourself here, you know, how do people around me see me, right? How do you think yeah. that's affected you as you've pondered on that question? Well, as I said, I think, you know, uh, I, I start noticing people's reactions and, um, and, and I started, you know, as I, as I understood those reactions, I started to speak up for, for uh, what I believed in. And yeah. it doesn't mean getting into an argument every time you speak to someone. But if you make little adjustments, you'll see major improvements over time, the way they, you know, you communicate with people. And uh, if you don't know how to do it, for me, honestly, you can start with your friends and family. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people panic, you know, that there's people around. I think the main thing is to start to understand that you're talking to one person and then, you know, you talk to two people and then, and then, you just keep going. Yeah, you know, sometimes it takes a uh, it ta it takes quite a bit of uh, grit or I don't know patience, but you got to let down your ego in order to uh, really come to terms with how do other people see me. It might not always be the answer that we want it to be, uh, but that's yeah. okay. Nobody's expecting perfection. Yeah, I agree absolutely. The second point that you had in your article, take care of the designer before taking care of the user, was a really interesting insight, specifically because as UX designers, we always talk about this end user whose experience we're always designing for. Um, yes. Why is it though that we tend to struggle with taking care of ourselves first? I think uh, I think this is essential to be honest. I, you know, I, I talk about empathy in the article as, uh, as an essential skill for a designer. Mm -hmm. And we all know that, uh, but I also point out we are not that good with empathy for ourselves. Uh, yeah. We don't really, because we don't really, we you practice it for other people. But if you think about it, when do you really practice empathy for yourself? When you pat yourself on the back, it's more the times that you're actually horrible to yourself. Say, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can't do this. You know, uh, we don't really practice it as much as we do for our users. So for me, as I mentioned in the article is getting, getting your stuff together. Right. Yep. I don't say exactly stuff in the article, but um, to produce your best work for me, you need to be at your best. So what's the best way to do it than taking care of yourself? Yeah. And then you even go into this is, you know, it's it's an empathy. It's in the mindset. It's uh, in kind of this mental, emotional state. But you even go into the physical with exercise, meditation, eating healthy. Uh, has that always been easy for you? Uh, not really, no. Uh, but you know, there's a there's a link between you know well being and uh, and physical activity, yeah. Obviously, and from a psychological standpoint as well. Uh, so 
I, I didn't know it uh, when I first started, uh, you know, doing sports and physical activity back in the day, but uh, it makes sense when you approach it from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you take care of yourself, you start eating healthy or, you know, exercising, it, it changes your mood completely. So that only makes sense, you know. You know, and again, I mentioned that I read this a couple months back and it was when I was in a spot personally where I just felt like, you know, my body as a machine was really struggling. And it stemmed from a lot of different things that I was doing that was unhealthy, um, wasn't eating right, stopped exercising. Uh, meditation is something that I've done on and off over the last couple of years as, as I've tried to deal with my own, you know, anxieties and whatnot. Um, but sometimes you just get into the groove of things and you forget about those simple little things that were contributing to like this greater being. And uh, as I start to take on this mindset of my body's a machine and I'm mindful of everything that I'm doing for that machine, uh, it's it's crazy how it really does change uh, a lot of different behaviors, but it changes the way I'm able to handle situations. Um, all those things just really popped out at me that I'm not dependent on what I thought I was dependent on in order to live this happy, healthy lifestyle. Doing the little things can contribute to that. Well, you said it, uh, you know, you started being mindful and I think most people don't even realize what that means. And uh, when you start exercising or doing whatever that's good for you, uh, you start noticing little, you know, little cues that your body gives you in that sense. And um, it's, it's most times I think people don't realize that anxiety gives you uh, some sort of gut feeling, you know, you feel, you feel bad, you, you feel that your body doesn't feel right, but they can't, can't quite grasp it. Uh, they don't know what what that means, and when you actually start meditating, for example, uh, you realize actually, okay, I recognize this feeling. Uh, I know what this means. I know what's my body telling me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's essential, to be honest. Then you go back to the basics, right? You go back to the primary needs you have, uh, which are taking care of your physical, your physiological, and spiritual side, and eat well, you know exercise, and meditate. Yeah, I totally agree. One of the uh, the darker truths that I don't think often gets talked about a lot, but I know a lot of designers uh, who are dependent on things like an Adderall prescription or something like that. Um, I myself have been prescribed an Adderall prescription for about three or four years. And um, again, just felt like I was dependent on it to function. But it, going back to this machine analogy again, is it just led to this uh, effect, which was you know, I, I feel apathetic, so I take the Adderall, I get crap done throughout the day, uh, but then at night, I feel just still this energy flowing, I can't shut off my mind, I take medication to fall asleep, uh, the next morning, I can't wake up, I feel apathetic, and I do it all over again, and it's yeah, a, so it's it's a, a crazy a cycle. It's a of, yeah, exactly, and uh, you know, it's that uh, search for the quick fix, which yep. is completely natural to go for. Uh, you know, you got that pill that makes you feel better. Yeah. But then, you know, the consequences of that are are insane and to be avoided. I don't know if you ever saw the Netflix documentary, but it was called Take Your Pills. It's in my list. It's uh, it's one That's, that yeah. my wife watched it and she was like, hey, do you mind watching this with me? <laughs> and that was her kind way of saying, do you know what you're doing to yourself? And uh, I've now, you know, I can... I actually say this proudly. I've been off my Adderall, Adderall prescription for about uh, three, coming on four months now. And I'm that's, able to, yeah, it's cool. And I'm able to make it by doing these things that you're talking about. Eating healthy, exercising, uh, being mindful of my sleep habits, meditating, uh, and I'll even throw in journaling, which has kind of helped me be grateful for those little things that happen throughout the day. Helps me manage like yeah. any depression that pops up. Those things that you mentioned right there, it's doing it's it's doing what uh, I need it to be doing in order to take care of myself. That's that's great. That's good for you, man. I'm glad to hear that. It's cool. Um, but now, once we get outside of this realm of just taking care of ourselves, we start talking about the people that we surround ourselves with. And you hit that with your third point, uh, being surround yourself with amazing people. Tell me a little bit about the amazing people that you surround yourself with. Yeah, so I've got a line on on the the article that says if friends are 
the family we choose co-workers are the friends we don't choose uh, <laughs> which is you know which is fair enough i think it's a delicate subject uh, because sometimes we, we have people we have friends that are uh, you know a bit toxic yeah. and it's not always easy to let these these people go uh, for me uh, i'm pretty lucky because i have a wonderful fiance and a really good and really good friends but I also, in the process, I also weeded out the toxic people. Mm -hmm. um, that comes, I think it's a natural, natural process, to be honest. It's, um, it's something that happens when you start taking care of yourself. You realize that some people you don't want around, yeah. but there's also people that you want around. Yeah. For example, I uh, have a really good friend who lives in Australia now. He, um, he wasn't happy with the uh, nine to five uh, uh, office job life. Mm -hmm. He left everything and everyone. Luckily, he was single, so then you know left any any uh, misses uh, back. Uh, he moved to Australia and he's just finished doing some some farm work to extend his visa there, and he's now pursuing a completely different career. For me, yeah. that's inspiring, and that's the people you want to surround yourself with. Yeah. And it's sometimes tough too, because those who we surround ourselves with may be the friends that we grew up with, or they're our childhood friends, or we've been friends for so long. But, you know, people do change over the years. And sometimes the things that drove us to, you know, a certain friendship changes over time. Yet we, it's difficult to let go of those relationships because they've got such a legacy. They've got such a, a longstanding, uh, you know, partnership that it's hard to let them go. But do you think it's still for the better? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, that, that, as I said, that happens naturally, I think, uh, cause otherwise you realize there's something off, you know, in your life. Uh, what is important uh, for me is to be proactive in the search for the type of people you want to hang out with and people you want to be inspired from. So as anything, you just need to do something about it and, you know, be proactive in that. Yeah, there's a a saying, or I, I can't remember it specifically or exactly, but it's something along the lines of, you are the combination of your five closest friends. And I don't know if it's yeah. the five or three or seven, I can't remember exactly, but let's just say five for the sake of this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I think of that often, because if we've only got five people that we're close to, and we're kind of this uh, middle ground or balance of the, the five of them, you can't have you know, four of them that are tearing you down and only one of them that building you up because you're going to lead to tearing yourself down all the time. I agree. I agree. And, uh, you know, you, you have to try to be a part of community as much as you can yeah. uh, in order to, to fight that, you know. So this question in your article, you said, uh, are the people around me pushing me to produce my best work? Is that something that you, you two then are mindful of? Of course, yeah. Well, I try to take inspiration from from other people as much as I can, and uh, I think it goes back to what you said earlier about ego. Uh, you know, when you have a big ego, it's really hard to let that really let that go, yeah. and uh, you don't understand how actually we were, you know, community animals in a way that uh, we we learn from each other. But uh, ego just keeps you away from it and just keeps you, you know, in that spot where you think you're the best or, or you know, you know better. But that, that's definitely not the case. So, yeah, I, I do try to um, take inspiration from, from, from people, you know, in general. That's awesome. And now as you're on this process of improvement and you're trying to progress, I guess, who you are personally, the people around you, uh, Sometimes it's kind of like going to the gym, right? Where you, you hit the gym one day and you don't see the immediate results. You hit the gym the second day, you don't see immediate results. But it's over a long period of time that you can finally start to see, okay, something is happening as I've been continuing doing this. I think that goes into your next point of comparing yourself to who you were yesterday as, a, as opposed to who someone else is today. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, comparison to, to others is a, is a big trait of imposter syndrome right uh, i think it comes natural to most used to uh, used to be quite big for myself to be honest uh, the time you spend comparing to others and and feeling bad about yourself i think it it robs you of happiness mm -hmm. uh, i say i say in the article uh, imagine you're writing uh, an autobiography 
uh-huh. and then ask, and then I say, ask yourself, would you compare your page twenty to someone else's page four hundred? Right. I, would, I mean, it's pretty silly, right? It, it doesn't make much sense, but it, we do it on a regular basis because you know we 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 are the uh, as you said, we are the result of of the people that are around us. So it's only fair that we compare it to to others, but there's a healthy way to do it. And, you know, there's a, there's a not so much healthy way to do it and comparing yourself to others. is just not good. Was the quote, um, it was in your article, what you aim at determines what you see. Did that come out of the Jordan Peterson book? Yes. So all the, all the big quotes are, are from the book. And I think, you know, that's what makes the, uh, the rule. I mean, that was my favorite quote from it. Yeah. There's, there's a quote that it reminds me of that I actually have on the homepage of my website. It's been meaningful to me throughout my life, but uh, it's uh, your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. And, you know, setting your sights ahead, setting your sights on what you are striving for, uh, I think ties right into that quote, right? You're, uh, yeah. It's not about what somebody else is doing. It's not about what page they're on on their book, uh, but what page you're on in your book and where you're going in that book. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I love that metaphor. Um, yeah, really good. So you actually you mentioned in your article about t- keeping a, a journal and writing down the ups and downs. Is that something that you're pretty good at? Uh, I, I mean, I try to. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can be good at it, uh, <laughs> but for sure I'm being consistent at it. Yeah. So that's the big thing, right? Uh, introspection again is 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 big on this one, and I personally write down. When I, as I said earlier, when I have these feelings, I try to analyze them. I try to make sense of them, even when I, I really can't. Yeah. Uh, but when you write something down, sometimes you realize, well, sometimes you realize how s- s- some stuff is just stupid. Right. Um, because it, on paper, you know, you read it back to you and you say, okay, this is my doubt. And it's not stupid to have doubts at all but when you write it down and you know be you're um introspective about it and you're actually you know you're thinking okay uh does this thought serve me or can i just leave it behind does yeah. this make sense or not and journaling has helped me doing that that's awesome uh it's uh it's impressive to see somebody who's uh willing to document i mean it takes time there's probably things you'd rather be doing are you keeping a physical journal or are you taking like more of a digital journal yeah man uh, old school uh 100 i've got uh yeah i've got just a simple journal nothing fancy uh just write on it every morning for 10 15 minutes and uh whenever i feel like it whenever i feel like i'm thinking something uh, brilliant. I just write it down and then maybe I read it back and realize it's not that brilliant, but it's not, it's that process that it's that process of, of just writing it down. Yeah. That, that helps me, uh, calm my mind down. Is there a reason you picked the physical journal as opposed to a digital journal? Yeah. I've read about, uh, the benefits of actually, you know, putting pen to paper instead of, um, writing on, on a computer, for example. Yeah um there are some benefits uh as to actually doing it's just the act of doing it and i think it it goes also to uh trying to avoid uh i don't know if you hear about it uh digital dementia so it's basically you know being around technology all the times you know doing my job as well it's it's not ideal so sometimes i just want to i just want to go digital uh sorry i uh, just want to go uh, analogic Yep. And, uh, you know, just write down yeah. on paper. That's cool. Yeah. It's a great insight for people who are trying to figure out how can I document these types of things. I do, I do agree. I think there's a big difference. And when you can take the pen to paper, uh, I do feel like I'm much faster at writing on a computer. Obviously, that makes sense. But yeah. if you're talking about this amnesia or whatever it may be, that, that happens when you just spend all your life in a digital world. Uh, getting outside of that and writing down a paper is super helpful. Absolutely, yeah. I want to jump now to your last point just for the sake of time because this is a key insight that I feel so many of us can get caught up in. And uh, it's so easy to point the finger at the rest of the world. Uh, And I love, love, love how you laid out this last piece 
Know your process before you criticize the world. Just speak to me a little bit about that, what it means to you. Well, this is to this is to understand to not jump to conclusions, as you said, uh, not do it right away. And uh, of course, I'm guilty of that myself sometimes. Uh, but as I said, and you know, I try to analyze it and you know, go back to it and realize it's to understand our process before we, we criticize others. So really, it's about improving mm-hmm. our thinking and uh, critiquing skills and try to learn from other people's mistakes because you can do that too. You can learn from your mistakes, but if you understand other people' mistakes, it's um, uh, it's, it's it's a little bit different because you understand the context of you know, in which maybe something has been done, and it, it, it helps you to learn to uh, build your critical eye and how to give feedback. I think. Yeah, you know, and you, you mentioned the context of the rhyme and reason somebody else is doing what they're doing or thinking the way they're thinking. Uh, and from an outside perspective, it's sometimes hard to get into get into that, right? Especially in this social media age where everyone portrays their best self to the world. We don't know what's going on behind the curtain, right? Yeah, exactly. And so critiquing design, uh, critiquing that kind of stuff, it can follow the same pattern. Um, so how do you think of that? How do you approach that then in your work life? Well, I, um, as I said, I, you probably got it from now. Um, I'm, I'm quite a big observer. So I try to find ways to give feedback, even when it's unsolicited. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also try to, you know, be really nice about it and talk to people, be honest and, you know, make sure, uh, I'm doing it to improve both myself and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not saying, you know, I want to improve others at all, but. I believe I, I would like someone to to tell me, you know, what they think about what I'm doing, because that helps me improve myself. So I, that's the way I see it. And if you're nice about it, uh, you don't bring anyone down. Uh, I think that's the way to go. You know, and there's there's this this love that has to that comes with it, especially when you're giving somebody like a personal critique as opposed to a design critique. That if that love's not there, there's no way it's going to be received. Absolutely not. And, you know, I think people just uh, struggle to detach themselves from their profession. So yeah. whatever they do, they think it's them. They did it and, you know, they feel judged, but it's definitely not the case, you know, and it's quite hard to understand. I'm currently reading a book. Uh, it's by Dale Carnegie. You've probably heard of it, but it's called uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've heard about it. Yeah. And it's it's an old book. And so that's kind of my reluctance and even wanting to jump into it is I just thought it's an old book. How, how up to date can it really be? But uh, it's more of the psychology approach about people to people interactions. And in one of the very first chapters, he talks about something that I applied to things like a design critique. But he basically says, in short, you think this is common sense, but we do it, we, but we don't do it still. And it's just as simple as tearing people down will never help them improve. You know, criticizing will never help them improve. And when we approach a critique uh, and just more of a critical manner, it's not doing anything positive. No, and funny enough, it's, it doesn't. So if you do that with yourself, it doesn't help you either. So if you critique yourself, say, oh, I'm such a dummy, I forgot something that doesn't help you yeah. that's not productive because you keep thinking about how dumb you are right and, you know and um it comes natural you know i still do it oh i forgot my keys I need to go back uh such a numpty but <laughs> you know it's uh it's, it comes natural but it's not helping you so whenever you do it as long as you're aware of of what you're doing uh that's absolutely fine you can correct it why was I, why was it done that way is one of your ask yourself questions here at the very end of the article. And I think we could all benefit by, by asking ourselves before opening our mouth to speak or, you know, comment something out on the keyboard. Why was it done that way? Um, it's a powerful question to take a moment and put yourself in that mindset. It doesn't take that much. Uh, you know, you can probably take that one second pause to ask yourself that. And I'm sure whatever you say after that will be much nicer than whatever instinct you have on that moment. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate your time, Rick. We've, uh, we've kind of hit our, our time cap here, but I, I do want to plug one more time for those who are listening to check out the link, read the article, um, 
you know, Rick's going to be a, a big time writer in the UX community here any day now, if he, especially if he keeps so. pumping out content <laughs> like this. Uh, I appreciate your time. Is there anything else left that you would uh, like to plug before we uh, sign off? No, I would just say whoever goes to actually read the article, uh, give me a follow. Uh, I'll have more articles coming up about design and um, yeah, just do that. Rick, you're a great guy. I appreciate your time. This is uh, this has been a cool experience for me being early morning and for you late afternoon. Uh, this has been a great opportunity for me. I hope it's the same for you and uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, man. It was really fun. Thanks everyone for joining us on Design Today. That's a wrap.